everyone, and welcome to another exciting broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For many of you, it's your first broadcast joining us of the year. Some of you classes have been here before already, which is awesome. If you are new to us, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, we just wrapped up with Alex Nelson and Club Rex talking about dinosaurs. Now, many of you kids may know, many of you kids may not know, birds are dinosaurs. So we're sticking on theme today as we start off another a week of exciting programs. Uh, that program, like everything we do, is on our YouTube channel. So if you want to check that out, share this with your friends and family later, I encourage you to do so. I will note we are live on a mountain in Idaho right now with the amazing folks at the Lucky Peak Research Station, uh, part of the Intermountain Bird Observatory at Boise State University. So the connection's been a little choppy as we get underway, but we're going to try and bear with us as we bring a really, really cool broadcast on my very favorite topics that we ever bring here, which is live songbird banding. Now, before we go in, I do want to give a special shout out to, to our YouTube classes. Now, we've got Miss Dykstra's class, but we've also got the greatest single name of a teacher in a bird program ever. So thank you, Sky Peck, for joining us today. Makes my day in so many ways. Um, Heidi, I'm going to turn it over to you. Heidi's been joining us for years. She's one of the best educators on planet Earth. And I'm so excited for, I know, no pressure at all. So yeah, I'm no excited pressure. to dive in and share the amazing work you guys get up to. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, thanks for having me. So I'm up here at our Lucky Peak Research Station. Uh, it's a station in the mountains just outside of Boise, Idaho. So we're on kind of the tip of the Rocky Mountains. And today, this morning, we're out here hoping to catch and tag some songbirds for some of our fall migration research. So our songbirds are moving from north to south, from way up in Canada through Idaho, and heading down to Mexico and Central America for many of these species. And we're hoping today to see these birds. We'll catch them. We have little nets set up to safely catch them, bring them back to this banding station. Um, and hopefully you guys will get to see us measure and weigh some of these birds and then let them go when we're done. Uh, so I can give you guys a little bit of background. Our crew up here, maybe I'll show you the crew and you guys can all wave. Here's our crew, they're hanging out. Uh, we have owl people, songbird people, and hawk people all up here today uh, working on our research station. So we're a pretty unique station. We study fall migration for a bunch of different species. So that means through September and October, somebody is always awake on this mountain researching something. So the owl people are up all night. The songbird people are up before sunrise to start uh, studying songbirds. And then the hawk people start in the afternoon and they go all the way until dinner time. So we're a pretty busy crew up here uh, and we rotate through a lot who does uh, what. So somebody's always awake. Uh, our crew is gonna go out. Did you guys go on a net check? No birds yet? Okay. So our crew went out and checked the nets this morning once already. Um, and in about 15 minutes, they'll go check the nets again. Um, we have these very fine mesh nets set up in the habitat that you guys can see behind me. So surrounding us is Douglas fir forests, these nice, tall, beautiful trees and this canopy. And then below is the thing that the birds love the most. So these green shrubs are cherry shrubs. So bitter cherry and choke cherry. Not very appetizing for people to eat, as you can tell by the name, uh, but birds love it. Another uh, creature that likes those shrubs is insects. So there's a lot of insects growing and living on those cherry shrubs. So you can imagine it's kind of a variety buffet for all the songbirds that are passing through here. So like I mentioned, they're heading south on their fall migration and they may be leaving places up in Canada or Northern Idaho. And a lot of these species are heading down to the Southern United States um, but some species head all the way down to Central America, like Guatemala and Belize. And so our goal today is to catch and tag these birds to help us understand how many there are. So this year, especially, we're actually seeing really high numbers of certain species, uh, birds called red-breasted nuthatches and white-breasted nuthatches. And then we're also seeing lots of chickadees as well passing through. Um, We'll have to talk to other banding stations and other scientists around the continent to figure out exactly why there are so many this year. Um, but our best guess is that maybe there was a really good food supply this year um, in the forests where they nest. And so they 
the adults had a lot of babies and all those babies are passing through our station now. So at the end of the season, we'll finally find out the answer to that one. Um, along with counting the birds, so we're catching and tagging them. And maybe I'll show you guys uh, one of our bands um, so you can see what they look like. Uh, let's see. Here we go. So we're tagging them with these really tiny aluminum bands. They have a nine digit number stamped into them. So no other bird in the in the continent will have this exact number sequence. So it's it'll be unique to each bird that we tag. They're really lightweight aluminum, so they're so lightweight that they don't register on our scale. They're less than a tenth of a gram. And that means that we can tag these birds without having any long-term impacts on them, right? We're conservationists. We don't want to be, you know, putting something heavy on that bird that's going to weigh it down for its migration. So we figured out that these lightweight aluminum bands uh, fit really nicely on the birds and allow them to go about their biz about their life after we let them go. Uh, so along with tagging them, that gives us an idea of how many birds there are in an area, how their populations are doing. We also collect a lot of information um, about each individual bird. So kind of like when you go to the doctor's office and they might measure how tall you are, um, they might weigh you to see how much, how big you are. Um, we do the same thing with the birds. And let me show you guys another tool that we have. Um, so we're weighing these birds. Uh, and that gives us a really great idea of how fat they are, which is key for migrating birds. Uh, you know, you guys, when you go to school for the day, you probably pack a snack, you probably pack a lunchbox, uh, and you bring your food with you. Maybe you have a water bottle to bring some water with you. Well, our little birds don't fly around with a little lunchbox in their beak as they're on their long migration journey. So instead of bringing food with them, they eat, eat, eat at places like this where there's good habitat, fatten up, and then make their journey south. So we're expecting birds here at our station to sometimes arrive with no fat. Maybe they've flown 500 miles. Uh, our songbirds fly overnight, which is uh, a lot of people don't know. Um, they may fly 500 miles and arrive here and their gas tank is empty, right? They've burned up all that fat. They don't have any energy left. Well, then those birds will stop here and forage in the habitat behind me and start fattening up. Um, my favorite thing is when we catch a bird, we tag it. We know, okay, this is number 867. And then we re-catch it the next day and it's fatter than it was the day before. Uh, that gives us great information that that bird is doing well. And it tells us that the habitat around me here is good and is supporting those birds on their journey. Um, so this station, we've identified that this habitat is really, really important for our long distance migrating birds. Um, before these guys come back um, from their net check, I wanted to show you guys another tool we use. These are our banding pliers. So these pliers allow us to close the band on the leg of the bird without actually touching the bird's leg. So you can see we have two different hole sizes. Um, we catch a bunch of different species up here. So the smaller hole is for when we're putting a, a small band on a little bird, and that bigger hole allows us to put larger bands on some of our larger species. Um, we catch about 50, nearly 60 species of songbirds every season up here. Um, so a really big variety of birds moving through this area. Today, what I would predict is that we'll see some of our shorter distance migrants. So we start our fall migration project in July, which seems crazy, like most of us would say that's summer, but for a lot of these birds, they're already done nesting and they're already moving south for the winter. So in July, we get a lot of our long, long distance migrant birds. They leave early because they have a longer way to go. So things like yellow warblers, black-headed grosbeaks, they kind of tend to leave first. Um, this time of year, we're kind of in the middle of our fall migration season. So we're still seeing some of those long distance migrants, but we're also getting new birds uh, that are our shorter distance migrants, like our sparrows, um, juncos, and ruby crowned kinglets. So this is kind of peak migration because we have this blend of our long distance migrating species and then our shorter distance species. So there's our little banding pliers. 
Um, like I said, these guys will check the nets soon um, and hopefully bring us some birds back to see at the station. Um, I could take questions now or I could talk to you guys a little bit more about migration before we uh, do our next net check, whatever you think, Jesse. Yeah, I was just going to say, actually, one of the questions we get every single time that we hang out with you is from kids about worrying about the birds getting injured. So if you fly into a net, it sounds like sort of a violent activity, sounds like something that could injure you. You talked about birds being caught multiple days in a row. Is there any risk of this? Is this something that requires training or could anyone go and do bird netting? Share the whole shebang. <laughs> Very good question. So, uh I'll start with, it takes a lot of training and a lot of permits to be able to do a station like this. So no matter what country you're working in, some entity is in charge of protecting wildlife for that country. And so we have to reach out to um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, and the Bird Banding Laboratory. So we have a variety of different permits. And each time we apply for one of those permits, we have to show and prove we've been trained how to safely catch and tag these birds and we know what we're doing um, and we also have to show that we have um, a scientific question a, a reason for catching these birds right um, there's not zero risk so i actually compare it to um i looked up the the rate of risk for uh, general anesthesia so if you get a surgery and you get knocked out and then you wake back up um the risk for some of the netting that we do is similar to that. So like I've had my tonsils out and my wisdom teeth out. So it's something that you wouldn't do lightly. You wouldn't just go to the doctor's office and get knocked out for no reason. Um, but up here we're doing research. We have important questions we want to answer. And so uh, the small risk to the birds um, for us and for bigger conservation is worth it. Um, the most common injury we see is if a bird will run into one of our nets at the wrong angle, they kind of tweak their little wing muscles. And you'll see them when they fly off, they'll kind of flutter one wing differently than the other. Um, so I would compare that to something like a twisted ankle where it doesn't feel that good. You might go rest during uh, recess instead of keeping running around. Um, but then by the next day, you're all right. Um, we've actually done the research on that to see what happens to these birds. If they have a little tweaked muscle, how do they do? And we recatch them and we recatch them fatter than the day before, which is great. So we're able to see um, and make sure we're not having an impact. Um, as you can imagine, <clears throat> our whole crew of scientists are doing this because we love birds. Um, we love being outdoors in nature and we want to help with conservation. Uh, so that's something we are always paying attention to is, you know, is it worth, you know, the 10 minutes that we have that bird in the hand um, to get that data from it? and then send it back on its way. Um, so yeah, it is worth it. You do have to have permits though to do it. And it takes a lot of training. I've been doing this for 15 years now, which is kind of hard to believe. Well, thank you for the very detailed answer. I love that. Uh, Miss Fisher's class, if you guys want to flick on mic, camera, anything else, I'll come to you for a question in a minute. Miss Dykstra's water rockers in Guelph today, they have a, a bunch of questions, which is great. Um, a classic one, Heidi, you get this every time too. What's the biggest bird you've ever banded? Super bird. Oh um, yeah. Uh, the biggest one I've ever banded is a red-tailed hawk. Um, I've missed every single time. So one of these days, I'm going to surprise Jesse and say, guess what? I was here. Uh, but I've <laughs> yet to be around for a golden eagle being caught. Uh, we do catch about one a year, though. Um, so their wingspan is as big as my arm span. They're huge. Um, they don't weigh that much because birds are lightweight. They weigh about 12 pounds, which doesn't sound like a lot. Um, but for a bird, that's quite heavy. So. I will note for our Ontario classes, I think they're pretty wide ranging across North America, but red-tailed hawks, I've seen hundreds of in my life. They're a very, very common raptor. I've seen one golden eagle and that is like the most special bird I've ever seen. And it was like for two seconds and it was just, I'm, I'm talking about it 20 years later. So that's a sign about how cool golden eagles are. Yeah, um, they're pretty amazing. Fisher's class, come on in and then uh, please, uh, Skypex group, if you guys have any questions, please do share them in the chat, but come on in Carsonville. Hi. Hi there, we've got Sean with a question. Hi, um, do you guys do you guys catch um hummingbirds? Ooh. Yeah, actually that's one of my main jobs. Uh our hummingbirds are have pretty much left us here in Idaho by now. Uh but we do have a station um in another town about an hour from here where we do hummingbird banding research. So we catch and tag black chinned hummingbirds, rufous hummingbirds, and calliope hummingbird, which is the smallest migrating bird in the world. Uh, they weigh the same as a dime, so very, very tiny and very lightweight. 
uh, they, they also weigh the same as three really big paper clips. So you can imagine how small that is. Even doing this for 15 years, does that not still boggle your mind that something that weighs as much as a dime can go like thousands of kilometers? That, that's just, it's absurd. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see. Oh, Miss Peck's class. They have a great question. Is it common to catch a bird more than once? You've talked about this a few times. Do you have, does it happen all the time? Is it rare? What's the deal? We get a lot of recaptures. So that's what we call it when we've seen a bird more than once. Um, most of our recaptures are same season recaptures. And most of those are same week. So during fall migration, like I mentioned, so birds are flying, they're burning up those uh, fat stores, they're emptying their gas tank, they land and they stay for anywhere between, you know, three days to eight days before they fly again. So we get a lot of recaptures in that time period. Um, during the nesting season, we get a lot of recaptures from between years. So a bird that was hatched here at Lucky Peak migrated down to Mexico or Central America and then came back to nest itself and were able to track those birds over their lifespan. Um, and then the most exciting recapture we get is when another scientist catches our bird or when we catch a bird and we don't recognize the band number. That means, oh wow, somebody else banded this bird, not us. Um, that's my favorite. So when that happens, honestly, a lot of times we just post, there's a uh, bird banding Facebook groups. So we post, hey, whose bird is this? Um, but we also have a more formal process where the bird banding lab connects us with those scientists uh, and we get to be pen pals, right? Like, oh, how old was she when you caught her? And oh, well, she was about to lay an egg when we caught her uh, and compare that information. So that's pretty exciting. And this is the, the fundamental essence of how you get this information about a bird going from, say, Canada to Belize, say, is that other scientists do catch it and give you that opportunity to connect and collaborate. So. I, I yeah. love this about science. I always like to harp on it for our students that, I mean, if to be a scientist, it takes a long time to end up in a position like Heidi's. Uh, is not an easy role by any means, but when you get there, you get to work with people all over the world. You get to be outside, you get to do what you love, and you get to talk to people about it in a way that really engages them. So I think that that's a really, it's a special opportunity for any kids that are keen on being a scientist. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, so many questions coming into the chat. You guys are awesome. Ms. Fisher, I will come back to you in just a minute. Um, another question we get all the time is Dykstra's group. Can the bands fall off? You're putting them on the leg. Can they pop off? What's going on? <laughs> they can't. So each bird we band, we put the band on based on what species it is. So for example, we know that every single dark-eyed junco that we band wears a size zero or a size one band. So that's a band that we've tested and put on their leg. We can spin it and move it up and down, kind of like a watch or a bracelet, but they're not stretchy. So imagine wearing a bracelet around your wrist um, that has a clasp, so it's closed all the time. Uh, so that band won't ever fall off. And luckily for us, birds' legs don't change size throughout their life. So we're, we know we can safely tag them and put that band size on, and their leg isn't gonna change. You know, It won't get too tight or too loose um, as the bird gets older. Um, so yeah, we get to pick the band size based on the species. Yeah. Uh, okay, a joint question from our two YouTube classes and then we'll go back to Ms. Fisher. Uh, is there a most common bird and is there a really rare bird, like a bird that shouldn't be there, that got blown in in a storm, anything you can share with us on that? So a bit of either side of the equation. Yeah, so each year our most common species can vary a little bit, but at this station, uh, ruby crowned kinglet is one of our most common. So. They're a tiny little bird. They weigh about the same as six paper clips or six M&Ms, um, really small little species, and they pass through this time of year. Um, we do get rarities, and that's, for scientists, that's always interesting. Um, it's fun for us because when you catch a new bird, you learn a lot. You know, you, you've never seen this bird before. You've not looked at its feathers. You don't know much about uh, how to age them or identify them. So you get to pull out the field guide and, and identify something rare. So that's pretty fun. Uh, we, I don't think there's a most rare bird because there's still species that we've never caught before. Um, but the birds that we've caught where let's say in 25 years that this project's been running, we've only ever seen one. They're mostly uh, birds from the East Coast. So in Idaho, we're closer to the West Coast of the United States. And every once in a while, a bird gets lost they end up on the wrong side of the Mississippi River, wrong side of the Rocky Mountains, uh, and they'll get to us here. Um, cool. So yeah, uh, this year we caught a black pole warbler, which is from pretty far away. Very cool. Thanks, Heidi. 
Um, by the way, the paperclip measurement, I'm picturing this for an ostrich and it makes me very happy. Like, you know, 27,000 paperclips. Um, <laughs> Miss Fisher's the group, math. <laughs> we'll find out. We'll get it for you on Google by the end. Yeah. Um, Miss Fisher's group, come on back into Michigan and take us away. Hi. Hi there. Waylon's got a question. Hey. All right. How much do they eat a day? Ooh. Mm. So I know for hummingbirds, how much they eat, uh, they can weigh or they can eat twice or even three times their own body weight um, in nectar and insects every day. Uh, for other birds, it varies a lot, and I don't have an exact number. Uh, for our hawks, like our raptors, they might go a few days without eating. You know, they have to actually catch prey, whether that's a cottontail rabbit or one of our little songbirds to eat. Um, so they can go a while without eating. Um, these birds during migration will go, you know, all night without eating, and then they have to stop and refuel each day. I want to harp on speaking of something that's a result of them eating this fat that you keep talking about because it's one of my favorite things I ever learned from you ever. So you you get a bird and you blow the feathers. How do you tell how fat it is? Like what are you just measuring the width or what's going on? Because it's very neat. Yeah. So uh, we're catching and tagging these birds and, you know, they have feathers covering their body. But underneath they have skin just like us, except their skin is very, very thin. It's actually see-through. So when we blow on the bird's feathers, we can part their feathers out of the way, just like, you know, me moving my shirt out of the way. And you can look on their throat and then down on their belly for fat. So their muscle and most of their body looks kind of purplish, reddish color. And then their fat is really orange. So they store it up in their throat and their neck and down on their belly because that allows them to stay streamlined as they're flying. Um, but they have kind of like us, this little dip in your neck here they have that a similar dip and they can fill that up with fat um, as they go so we score it on a scale um from one to seven we never see seven fats here um so for us basically one to five um but yeah we score it on a scale and all of us are kind of calibrated to rate it the same so let's just again we're going to harp on this for a second together you can blow the feathers out of the way and the skin is so see-through you can see the fat imagine looking at your stomach and seeing the fat and the organs in there it'd be really really freaky and weird but birds heidi gets to do that every day and there's nothing to her so that's again one of the weird perks of being a scientist is freaky things with animals you never knew um <laughs> by the way we have a verdict on ostrich and paper clips it is 100,000 paper clips to make an ostrich there you go that's our <laughs> Science of the day. I'm going to use that. Thank you. I like it. You're welcome. Jeez, um, you guys are the best YouTube audience of all time, too. And hopefully we get some birds coming soon. Fingers crossed. We, we almost always get birds. We do the We're program. on a net check, so I think they might be back with birds soon. Let's see a best one. Ooh, how many birds do you band on average a day from Miss Dykstra's class? A day it varies a lot. So right now we're in between cold fronts. So when a cold storm blows through, uh, that can really uh, cut off bird migration. So as the birds are coming from north to south, they might run into that storm and not be able to get through. Um, oh, yeah, we've got birds. Do you mind banning it, Mari? Okay. We have a bird. Uh, <laughs> so Mari's going to be banning this. Let's see. Ooh, let me aim my camera. There we go. There's Mari. Oh, um, <laughs> oh, uh, oh, a day. We've been catching about... 60 to 100 birds a day throughout this uh, migration season and during our three-month season we catch about six or seven thousand birds a year so mari's got a oh a cassin's finch nice so this streaky little brown bird and so she's pulled out a band she knows what band size it needs um, based on its species so it gets a 1b band um, and she's going to use the pliers. Well, first, maybe check the number. All right. Here we go. Do you mind recording, Arden? All right. There we go. Very cool. <laughs> so we've got our data sheets here full of data for these birds. And, oh, oops. I flipped it to the wrong page for you. So, Mari is going to read off that band number. 3011. So we're always checking to make sure the band number is correct. Um, that helps us keep track of our data and then also make sure that we've picked the right band size. 
So Mari's gonna open that band and make it into kind of a C shape and then slide it around the bird's leg. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, it fits kind of like a watch or a bracelet. So it goes around that bird's leg and it will be able to spin and move up and down. And those pliers are closing the band without touching the bird's leg because of that nice hole I showed you guys earlier. So she's gonna work to get that nice and closed, make sure it spins, make sure there's no gaps in the leg. And yeah, let's see, can you, nice. you guys see that? There go. Yeah, there's that little band. Cool. <laughs> so, you. and then Mari's gonna collect some data on this bird. So measuring it, measuring its wing, uh, we'll weigh it. Um, and then, yeah, you guys will get to watch her uh, blow on its belly and, and see whether it's fat or not. So 89 millimeter wing, we, uh, we're scientists, so we use the metric system, even though we're here in the, in the States. Oh yeah, no, yeah, go for it. Oh yeah. Okay, so Noah just said he has golden crown kinglets, which are really, really cute. No offense to that cast and stench. <laughs> no, no offense to the poor um, finch. <laughs> but uh, even us as scientists, we're excited about golden crown kinglets. So they're not a very common species, but it seems like you guys have been catching a decent number this year. So uh, I was mentioning, you know, the chickadees and the nut hatches we're getting more of than normal, and it seems like we're getting more golden crown kinglets too. So uh, the bird Mari has, it looks really tiny, but it's going to weigh probably between 20 and 30 grams. So 20 and 30 paper clips. Noah's bird is going to weigh like five or six paper clips. So it's one of the tiniest. It's really hard to even see in my hand from far away, but. Yeah, there you go. Oh, beautiful. And you can see why they're called Golden Crowned Kinglet. Nice. And another one. There you go. So Arden's got one too. Cool. Yeah. Well, there you go. We got bird treat, guys. I'm glad. I like so how they. I like how the, the weighing happens when you put them in the tube. Oh. Heidi, are you looking for more questions? I can come back to the kids. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Why not? You guys can. You guys can watch them work in the background. We can. This is very special, and if you need to pause for any moment to show us anything cool, we are of course all in. Um, yeah, a great good. question from Miss Peck's class, actually related to what we're doing right now. Do the birds have germs? Can people get sick from them or uh, from people handling them? Or can the birds get sick? Can people get sick either or? Great question. Yeah, good question. So we're always uh, keeping track of that. And, you know, we sanitize our hands. Um, but luckily, since we're mammals and, and birds are totally different than us, um, a lot of the issues that birds have, uh, we can't catch. Um, so you've probably heard of avian influenza. Um, birds like ducks and gulls and raptors can have that um, sickness, but our songbirds, as far as our research has told us, um, can't catch that. So the most common disease that we see um, with these birds is something called pox, um, where they get kind of little warts on their feet. And that's something that birds can pass to each other, so we're always sanitizing our hands, um, but humans can't catch it. So that's convenient for us, but it is related to, you know, like pick and pox virus. It's the same thing, um, but it's just the bird version of that. So there's no one measuring that teeny, teeny, tiny wing on that kinglet. Um, and yeah, I'll be excited to ask these guys uh, how fat these birds are. Me too. So uh, I've been banding birds for about 15 years. Uh, this station, we have a lot of folks who are you know, done with their bachelor's degree. So they've gone to university and um, gotten a four-year degree. And then many of them are going to go on to probably get a master's degree or a PhD later. So uh, this is a really cool job, um, you know, starting out as a scientist. Um, we get people from all over the world uh, coming here to work. Um, and so gaining some experience and, you know, these guys by now, they've been banding for a long time. So they're pros at uh, banning these birds, but pretty cool to have have all these people get to come from all over the place to learn about this. It is, and you've got such a cool yurt too. It's fantastic in there. Yeah, there's, a, uh, uh, there's Arden blowing on this little bird, so she's checking its fat. <laughs> What's your verdict? Any any fat? Skinny? Okay. Uh, kind of three. Yeah. Oh yeah, three. three. Okay. 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 Three, well, hopefully three, tomorrow three. you catch the bird at the four or a five. It just eats like a lot. Like a ton yeah, of food. exactly. Yeah, maybe we'll uh, recap it. 
I'm going to head really quick to Miss Fisher's class. We're going to do one more round of questions, and then we're going to leave you to all this amazing bird banding. Uh, come on back in, girl. Hey. Hey, this is Julian. How far can birds fly? Ooh. A long way. So the species we study that probably goes the farthest is Rufus hummingbird. So they can nest all the way up in Alaska, and they winter down in, like, southern Mexico um, and down approaching Central America. So many, many thousands of miles. I'd have to do the math, but probably four or 5,000 miles. Uh, these little golden crown kinglets, they might be from 100 miles away. And for the winter, they might stay here in Boise or they might go a little farther south. So uh, they're not traveling as far, um, even though they're that tiny. So they can actually survive the winter in Boise where, you know, it's below freezing most of the winter. So they're tough, tough little tiny birds. I was just going to say, too, for our kids, uh, the Arctic turn, the biggest migration in the world, is all the way from south of New Zealand to the Arctic. So 25,000 miles a year total that they'll fly, which is just unfathomable. Most of us will never even fly that amount in their entire lifetime, and birds do it annually, which is insane. Uh, Heidi, look like you were going to show us something before I go to the final two questions. Is there anything you wanted to, we're going to show, or am I crazy? Oh, well, I was going to show Mari just weighed this bird, so we, we stick him upside down in a little tube to yes. weigh them. And then now that she's done weighing it, she'll pull it back out. But uh, people always think that's pretty funny that that's how we weigh the birds. But it's very funny. Uh, I've seen it many times. We convince them they're Arden's weighing this one. We can't just convince them to stand on the scale. So that's our trick for getting them to stay. So funny. It's, I, I've go. seen it 20 times at this point with you, and it makes me smile every single time. It's a really, it's great science. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's see. Oh. Um, we've got questions more about the band. Miss Peck's class, and then I'll wrap up with one from Miss Dykstra. If a bird of prey eats a small songbird that has a band, will that hurt the hawk? Never had these ones before. This is really interesting today. It's a good question. So we've actually had band returns. So if you ever find a banded bird or you find a band, you can submit it to the bird banding lab or the bird banding office in Canada. Uh, we've had some bands turned in from like a great horned owl pellet or a screech owl pellet. Um, so it is possible. They Raptors, their digestive system is designed to be able to swallow bones. So the bands for them aren't any different. Um, and aluminum is a, a safe metal, you know, it's not going to poison them. Uh, so they can eat it along with the bones of whatever bird they've eaten and then regurgitate it and spit it back up. Uh, yeah. One time we saw feathers floating down from the trees and we looked up and there was a pygmy owl eating a little mountain chickadee. And not too far along as it was eating the chickadee, a little leg fell down, landed on the ground, and it had a band on it. So it was one of our chickadees that the little pygmy owl ate. So it was fun to watch, but we felt a little bad for the chickadee. So there's the rivalry between it the birds. Do we, do we have rivalries between the owl people and the songbird people at the banding station too? Like, is it like a niche thing? What do we think? No. Oh, are we releasing? <laughs> Did you say there's a competition thing? <laughs> Maybe. No, it's not bird? usually, but it doesn't happen very often that, our, at the, that the owls get our songbirds. So, Are we, um, it looks like you're about to release a bird. I just want to make sure I'm not missing that if that's happening. Yeah, I wanted to uh, get a video maybe of uh, Noah releasing this little kinglet when he's done. Um, we have other visitors today, so we get people coming from all over. So I think today we might have a group from Oregon visiting. Um, so they've grown They've driven away is to uh, come see all the cool birds here. So, uh, yeah, when Noah's done with that with that bird, we'll, uh, we'll let it yeah. fly. A quick last question then. Is it easy to catch the birds? Is it like, is this a challenge? Or once you have the net set, does it all go pretty swimmingly? Uh, when you have the net set up in places where we think the birds will fly through, um, it can be tough. So today it's actually a little windy, and it's probably why we didn't catch birds right off the bat this morning. Um so it can be tough uh, if it's windy, if it's rainy, we have to close the nets. So we're not able to do our research. Um, but other than that, uh, it's pretty easy. We have to hike a ways up some pretty tall hills to go check the nets. Uh, but that's it. I moved from Ontario to Newfoundland last year. So I'm all about hills now. My whole life is just everything is uphill, even both ways in the snow, middle of summer uh, for our Ontario kids. You have no idea. Come out east or go out west and you'll find some. It's not just a glacial flat plain anymore. Uh, yeah, right. Not flat uh, at all. I'm gonna check and uh, see if this bird is. Yeah, 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 you know, like, I don't want to miss anything. Do you mind being on camera? Yeah, do you mind being on a little live? Okay, so let me see. 
it's going to set them up. Watch this little go. guy fly. Yeah. Oftentimes, sometimes you kind of have to encourage them. Look at that. There we go. Wow. Well, thank you, volunteer stranger. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Uh, by the way, that has never happened. Every time we've ever done a bird release before this, they've been instant. Like the fact that it sat in the hand for so long. Okay, you can do it. You can do it. It's amazing. Ah. Yeah, that was fun. Heidi, this has been so much fun. Again, I'm going to make sure our classes know a little bit more about the amazing work you can do at the Intermountain Bird Observatory. Tomorrow, we've got another program with you. So if any of our classes have colleagues, friends that want to join in and watch that, uh, this is on our YouTube channel. So if you want to see the bird get released, learn all about this again, share with your family and friends, you can do so. A huge thank you to Miss Peck, Miss Dykstra on YouTube, and Miss Fisher's class live. And Heidi, before I bring in Miss Fisher to say farewell, is there any last message you want to share with us about the work that you're doing or anything to leave them off about birds? <laughs> Ooh, uh, well, nothing that I can think of right off the bat. I mean, these little songbirds, they're all around you guys. Uh, something cool to check out is a website called Birdcast, where you can actually see how many birds have flown over your area on a given night. Um, so that's pretty cool. You can check that out. Um, but yeah, mm. Birdcast. Uh, I will make, get that in so, a link to everybody, too. <laughs> oh, wait, I have to show you guys one more thing. Can you guys see these turkeys walking yes, through our camp? <laughs> what is this, Heidi? This is the best program ever. Oh. I don't know. These turkeys just wanted to say hi to you guys. There they go. <sighs> Man, this is, a, <laughs> this is a legendary program today. The connection, the bird release, turkeys, holy. Yeah. Heidi, thank you so much. I'm going to bring in Miss Fisher's group to say as, as excited as I am about the turkeys. Thank you so much, Carson, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.